So today our scripture reading will be from Exodus 20, verse 1 through 4, and then verses 7 through 11. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, no, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sab Sabbath day and made it holy. The word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So when you're driving down the road and you're going too fast and you see the lights in the back shining and they tell you to pull over, how do you feel? Ah, a little panic? Huh? Dread? Mm-hmm, a little dread. What about, what's that? Stupid? <laughs> Guilty? Yes. What about when you're on the side of the road and you're far, maybe you've been in an accident and you're scared and you see the police sirens coming, how do you feel? Good. When you see a, a sheriff's deputy or someone coming in a uniform and a car that has resources, you feel what? Thankful. Yay. They're here. They're here to help. Well, Today we are starting a two-week sermon series on the Ten Commandments. And the, God's law can be both of those, can't it? Right? It can be, oh, I got, I got caught. I did something. Somebody saw me. I maybe overstepped a bound. Or I did something I know that I, I wasn't supposed to do. And we're like, oh. Or... It can also be a, 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 something to rejoice over, to say, this is good, this is helpful, this is what I need. And so I want to hold both of those out to you as we look at the Ten Commandments. See, last fall, we uh, spent several weeks in the book of Exodus together, a, a Love That Delivers, that was the name of our series. And when we got to the point in the story where Moses went up the mountain and came down with the tablets, I said, we're going to put a pin in that and come back to it because it takes a while to talk about the Ten Commandments. We talked about other things in the book of Exodus. So today we're coming back to it. Um, and ten years ago, for those of you who were around and maybe remember, we did a similar thing. We did a series of Exodus in the fall, and then between Epiphany and Easter, we did a ten-week series on the Ten Commandments. And so this time around, we've got another plan for Lent. So we're only going to spend two weeks on these ten words, these ten um, commandments. And here's my plan. We're going to do the first four this week, today, and the second six next week. And how are we going to do it in just two weeks? 
Well, we're going to follow Jesus' lead and summarize the commandments into two headings. When Jesus was asked what was the most important commandment, to obey, his answer was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said, and the second is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And so we're going to get, and that's where we get our two, first two priorities in our church mission statement that we have a mission statement of growing disciples in all generations by loving God, loving others, and serving the world. So loving God is a heading for the first four commandments, and loving others for the second six. If you haven't noticed that before, that felt really helpful to me when someone pointed that out some years ago. Love God, love others. So... As to how to boil the first four down this week and the second six down next week into single messages, I'm also following Jesus' lead by turning things upside down and looking at things from a the last shall be first kind of perspective. I, I don't know if anyone else has ever done this. I'm just sort of was laying there thinking about this a few weeks ago going, well, let's try it. The last shall be first. <laughs> so... What if, that's, I wondered, what if we look at the first four commandments through the lens of the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And next week, do something similar with the last commandment. I might have lost a few of you there. So stay with me. I think you'll see it when we, in a few moments as we walk it out together. So first, let's talk about that word commandment. How do we feel about the word commandment? What? Ugh. Absolutes. It sounds like absolutes. Obligated. There might be one or two people in here who love the word commandments. Yes? It's a strong word. That's right, Rex. It's a strong word, and it can, fe- it can, it can stir up strong reactions to us. Like, we're, you're not the boss of me, right? Like, being commanded to do things, right? Some of us have um, responses to that because maybe they were held over us um, as rules you had to follow or else, right? Or you had that sense in your spirit about them. Um, Others I know have shared with me that just all the ways that the Ten Commandments have been sort of a political weapon in our country in recent years. And people are like, yeah, I don't really want to talk about them. Like we have these, it doesn't feel good. So I want to offer a couple other ways of talking about commandments. First, from the godly play lessons in our Summit Kids curriculum. They call it, I think, what is it, Wendy? The ten best ways. The ten best ways. Like, here are some good ways of going forward in life. Um, That when we live into these ten statements, we find goodness in them. The ten best ways. That's, a, that's one way it's a little softer than commandment. Uh, someone else pointed out to me, what about the Ten Commitments? The Ten Commitments. Rather than command someone else telling me how to do things, and in, it can be more of an internal commitment to live these words out in my life, in our lives. And then there's also this. To look at what, if you... if. Um, you were paying attention when Bernard read it, and which maybe we got missed because of we got into the commandments themselves, but it never says these are the commandments. Do you know what it says? These are the words that God spoke. So they're just words. And words have, that carry wisdom. They do get interpreted in the Old Testament and the New Testament as commandments, so it's fair to call them commandments. But in their first iteration he came down from the mountain and said, these are the words from God that I heard. So that, that gives a different sense as well, right? So I want to hold all of those as we, as we move forward in this. Okay, so now my proposal for today is that the fourth commandment or commitment or word to keep the Sabbath holy, I think it can contain and hold and help us understand more fully all of the first four commandments. Let me read it again. 
Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Do you hear that rain? (laughs) So at its simplest, Sabbath is a day we set aside from the other days of the week to remember that God is first. By stopping our work and our busyness, or whatever it is you do during the rest of the week, by stopping and having a day that's different than the rest, one day in seven, we are physically living out the first four commandments. Putting God first, which is the first commandment, the first word, the first best way. And then we're directing our attention on God, not on anything we can make with our hands, which is the second word. Don't make idols and don't worship idols. What you can make with your hands is not something to worship. God alone is worthy of our worship. And then on the Sabbath, one of the things we do is we gather for worship and we say sacred words. We practice praising God's name and affirming God's glory and goodness, remembering that when we say God's name, it means something. So that when we say God's name without regard or we misuse God's name in a curse or an angry moment like when the sirens are coming and we did something we didn't want them to see, when we say those words, we feel our, the contrast in our spirit. Yeah, that doesn't feel right. I mean, maybe for a moment it gives a little good adrenaline rush. And then we're like, ah, God's name is holy and good, not a profanity. But, it, but taking that day aside and worshiping and remembering God's holy name helps us live out that third command that third word, of keeping God's name holy. Do you see that? Do you see where I'm, I'm going with that? that? That Sabbath is a container for the first four commandments. When we really do it, when we keep the Sabbath, it means we're actually doing the first four words, the first four commitments all together. I also noticed that the commitment to keep the Sabbath is rooted in the character and action of God. God created the earth in in six days, the story says, whatever that means. That God created the earth in six days and on the seventh day rested. And so the first commitment is likewise rooted in the character and action of God. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt and delivered you from slavery, so don't put any other gods before me. So Sabbath keeping directs our hearts and minds towards God's character and God's actions in the world and invites us to respond, to live in the same rhythms of the one in whom we are created, work and rest giving honor to God, giving honor to the one who has set us free. (laughs) It's okay. So I want to spend a couple minutes together reflecting on the practice of keeping the Sabbath holy. Or we can put a W at the front of that, holy. Right? It might be one of the most difficult commandments to keep. Especially as 21st century Americans. Why do you think it's so difficult for us to keep the Sabbath and take a day 
of rest. What are some reasons? Yeah, Chrissy. I, I heard that with football is on Sunday. What was the first thing you said? We are valued for what we do. It's a cultural work ethic that your value is based on your productivity, right? On what you can get done and what you can get done that is measurable, too, right? Mm hmm. We got to save for retirement. Every day counts. Mm hmm. Why else is it difficult to take a day of rest? Dennis? Sometimes we find someone to use our help to help. Right. Other things come up, and we're like, okay, well, I got I to gotta help this person. We want to be useful. We want to be helpful. Yeah, Carly. It's hard to rest sometimes. That, I think, comes back to, well, where I go with that statement, Carly, I bet you have more on that, is we, all, we don't always give ourselves permission because we think we're not doing enough. And what is going to happen when we sleep? Or what's going to happen when we take that nap? Or what's going to happen when we just sit and listen to the rain on the roof? Yeah, Lori. There's not enough hours in the day, so the only other option is to use that other day in the week. Yeah, Chrissy, or, yeah, Chris. Yeah. That's right, right. When you finally get a day at home, you're like, okay, we've got to water the plants, we've got to mow the lawn, we've got yard work to do, we've got stuff to do, right? Yeah. So... These are all really good, good realities, right? We wrestle with these things. I think there's part of it, too, is lack of habit. We just maybe aren't in the habit. Or if we ever were, we got out of the habit, and then we just don't think about it. We also, um, what did we think about what did our parents do with their time and their rest? What models do we have for rest in the week? And did, did, our, did our folks do it or did people we look up to do it, right? That would give us permission to do that, right? And then I think there's some lack of community around it because in the 1950s, everything was closed on Sundays, right? There were the blue laws, right? Those, those of you who remember those, I only have been told about them. I wasn't around for that. where you couldn't go to the hardware store to get the thing to do the project because the hardware store was closed, right? And it was just a community value that said, today's the day to go to church and then go have a pot roast and maybe take a nap, right? So other people were doing it. When I, there's a book called The Mud House Sabbath um, by Lauren Winner. And she writes about becoming, she grew up Jewish and became a Christian in college and so became part of an Episcopal church. And she goes through some of the, the disciplines and faith practices in the Jewish community that Christians could learn from. And she said that Sabbath was the one thing she missed the most because there was such a community aspect about it. Other people stopping to... As, as one friend says, to, play and pr to pray and play unto the Lord. A day to pray and a day to play. So, and then I wrote this one down, which we've already said. It's the American way. Work, work, work. Time is money. <laughs> and the big question that I think comes up is, what is at stake when we stop? What is at stake when we rest? I think of the ancient Hebrews in any agricultural society that you have to plant, you have to reap, you have to harvest, you have to take care of the, the thing, right? Whatever you're growing. And one day can make a huge difference in a crop's harvest. I remember learning that living in Ellensburg where the hay harvest is a big deal. And one day of rain will ruin a lot of things. 
right? You got to get it in when, the day, when it's ready to come in. So it would be scary to leave fields untended for even just one day. When your winter food supplies or the year's income is at stake, you have to trust that God will provide. And what does that do? It puts our eyes and our attention back on God rather than what our hands can do and make. And it's really hard. Yeah. And we think about, it won't get done. There's always more to do, isn't there? There's always more money that we could use. There's always another whatever that we think we need. More phone calls to make or more emails to send, more people I need to take care of, more laundry to fold, right? More light bulbs that need changing or batteries and smoke detectors that need, all the things, right? We can't comprehend a day that in our mind gets wasted. And um, stopping for one day in seven feels like a sacrifice. But it also reminds us that we were not meant simply to work. We were also made for joy. We were also made for play, for relationship. And in when we stop working, we have time for one another. We have time for our bodies to rest. And our bodies will tell us when we haven't stopped in a while, won't they? You'll get sick. You'll have something happen where you have to stay home and rest. Your body says, no more of this pace. You've got to stop. Also, I think one of the troubles we have and what's at stake is if we stop, we'll have to think about the pain in our lives that is too much to bear. Staying busy keeps those dark thoughts at bay. But Sabbath worship invites us to bring our broken hearts to God and hear words of love and assurance of grace and to show up and be with people who remind us, who speak words of you are forgiven May you live in peace and speak those words to one another. So at its heart, Sabbath keeping is the physical practice of trusting God. Trusting that God will provide. Trusting that it's not all up to me, it's not all up to you, it's not all up to us. And that it's okay to stop spinning and be present to God and to one another. And that we, when we are rested, we're actually more productive. Right? And it's important to note that not only is Sabbath keeping one of the ten best ways God gives peop- God, the people's God, but the keeping of holy days, where we get our word holiday, holy days, special days and weeks and months throughout the year, to stop and celebrate those are also scattered throughout the Old Testament. The, the words, the commandments, to stop and play and have a feast. Gather with friends and sing and dance. Yes, there's work to do in this life. But there's also parties to be thrown and joy to be experienced and laughter to be shared. And there's also creation and all its wisdom given as a gift for you to enjoy. And so rest and enjoy it, God says. Another word in Scripture, another command in the same spirit, is to let the ground lie fallow every seventh year so that it can rest and be nourished rather than depleted of its nutrients. And what happens when you give land some time to lay fallow and you restore it with nutrients? What happens when you plant it the next year? It's better. It's more productive, right? So to our bodies, our lives are more productive and more fruitful when we take time. 
sabbaticals for professors in academia and pastors in ministry has been something that folks dis- discerned, sent, did, I don't know, how long, Jamie, have sabbaticals been around? You're a church historian. <laughs> Pretty much from the beginning of academia, sabbaticals as a time that says every six to eight years, or I don't know what it is in academia, maybe ten years, you have to learn, some, you have to earn some tenure. Take a take a semester off, take a year off, and go and rest your brain. Maybe go learn something, study something. Instead of pouring out, let something be poured into you. And pastors, the same thing. After six or, you know, in the sixth or seventh year of a pastor's time in a, in a ministry, uh, churches often give sabbaticals, time away, three or four months at a time to just rest and, and, and refresh and be renewed so that the following years can be more fruitful and energized. We think that it is up to us to keep the world turning, don't we? If we stop, our world will fall apart. This is very self-absorbed, arrogant thinking. Idolizing our own productivity instead of worshiping God alone. So here's the reality, friends. One day we will stop all the busyness, whether we choose to or not. Our bodies will not always be able to do all the things. I spent some time with friends who used to be in these pews every week who are now shut in and not driving, not going anywhere. And what do they have on their hands but time and rest? And there will be that day when our lives will come to an end. The practice of keeping Sabbath one day in seven prepares us for our final rest in God. We practice on Sabbath that in both life and in death, we belong to Christ. I want to close us today with Psalm 23. I invite you to close your eyes Rest your body, maybe take a deep breath, wiggle your toes, shrug your shoulders, and hear these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I lack for nothing. I invite you to trust in God's goodness and God's providence. Consider the many ways God has provided for you and your family. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters, places of rest, places of calm, where nothing productive is expected. In these places of rest and calm, God restores, refreshes my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, God will show you to good paths, the best ways. Consider some of those paths God has led you on and the goodness you have found along the way. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Darkness comes in times of uncertainty, times of fear, seasons of loneliness. We walk through valleys of illness, injury, addiction. One day we will all walk through the final valley of death. 
In those valleys, God is there with us as comfort and strength. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Consider that table as a Sabbath table. A table of rest from all the worries and weariness that come at us the other six days. God sees our work and rests a hand of blessing on our heads. Fills our cup to overflowing. But only when we take the time to stop and sit. To rest from our labors and trust God first. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. All the days. The six days we labor and the seventh days of rest. The weeks of planting and harvesting and the holy days of feasting and dancing. God is with us. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We practice trusting God with one day in seven, putting God first, worshiping God alone, honoring God's name. And when that day comes, when our days here have ended, we will rest forever in the one whose love is forever. Amen.